Good afternoon and welcome to Solent Sport News. I'm Harry Smith and this is your Half Past Four News Bulletin. We have some breaking news now. Over the past few minutes, the Estadio Nacional de Andorra has caught fire ahead of their World Cup qualifier tomorrow night against England. The dugout area of the stadium has caught alight just as the preparation for the vital qualifying clash got underway. It is currently uncertain how this will affect tomorrow's fixture as England currently sit top of Group I and will be in need of a win to build their confidence of qualifying top of the group. The match was set to be a, a historical one as it was due to be the first England senior men's match to be officiated by a full women's refereeing team. For more updates on the story as it progresses, visit Solent Journalism's website. Newcastle United legend Alan Shearer believes the takeover is a great thing for the city, but insists that improvements are needed both on and off the pitch. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's important that they don't just spend it on the team. I think the ground is, is shabby and it, it needs improving. The training ground needs improvement. They, they, they're they're going to invest in the, uh, in the city, um, which is a great thing for, for our people here in Newcastle, because I think the city deserves that. The Tyneside club, who currently sit 19th in the Premier League and who have yet to record a league win this season, have been thrusted into the financial elite of the footballing world following the Saudi Arabian-backed £300 million takeover. The deal was finally sealed yesterday following 18 months of uncertainty due to controversy surrounding who would have control of the club should the takeover commence. The Premier League were provided with legally binding assurances that the Saudi state would not control the club and therefore gave the green light for the deal to go ahead. The sale sees the end of Mike Ashley's tumultuous time at the helm of the Magpies. The Sports Direct CEO took over in 2007 and has since become a polarising figure in the North East. His departure was cause for celebration for the Toon faithful and they took to the streets in their masses to welcome the newfound fortune. We spoke to Vavil Premier League and Newcastle correspondent Harry Rory to gain an insight in the reaction to the takeover on Tyneside. To start off with, what does the takeover mean to the Newcastle faithful and, and why? It means everything to this fan base. We've had 14 years of Mike Ashley and I don't need to go in to, to what happened. I mean, before Ashley arrived at this football club, we were regulars in Europe. I think it was 10 out of the 12 seasons. It, that has gone to, you know, we now had two relegations under him. We've had years upon years of fighting for relegation. And I think everyone just sees this now as a new era for this football club. And it is incredibly exciting times like you'll have seen uh, last night at St James's Park. I was fortunate enough to be there and I've never experienced anything like that in my life. Uh, it was my generation's Alan Shearer coming home moment. That's what it felt like. It, it just means so much to the people. You, you mentioned, obviously, how... It, it feels like a new dawn uh, for, for Newcastle. Uh, how, how will the takeover impact in the long term? Has anything been outlined yet for the plan for the long term? We've heard nothing officially from Amanda Stavio, the consortium, but we've, we're told that communication will come in, in the next few days of a business plan. She came on Sky Sports last night and turned around and said, we want to win the Premier League title between five and ten years, which is just an incredible thought. But... A lot of people like to talk about financial fair play and all these things, which of course are going to play a huge factor. But the Saudis, I don't think, would come to Premier League football to make up the numbers. They're here to win titles. They want to compete with the other state-ran oil clubs, such as Paris Saint-Germain and Manchester City. There's a huge contest in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia are now involved in it and involved with, it with Newcastle United. So you said you mentioned you were amongst the fans last night celebrating the takeover. Um, could you go into a little bit more detail about the scenes that you saw and just what you witnessed last night in terms of the celebrations? Well, I don't think I'm the only person, but I've got a pretty sore head at the minute. Uh, <laughs> it was an, an incredible, incredible night. It uh, started with a, with, a, with a drink in the pub and then off to get with cans, of course, uh, to St James's Park, where probably about five or 6,000 people gathered outside the ground, uh, just singing, chanting, and, and just a, a sense of relief in the air that, the club is now free of Mike Ashley and heading into a new era where there's just so much it seems to look forward to. And I think they're going to have to expand that stadium because 52,000 ain't going to be enough. Spain and France will clash in the final of the UEFA Nations League on Sunday following France's victory over Belgium last night. A late goal from French fullback Theo Hernandez secured the World Cup champions a place in the final that will be held in the San Siro. 
Goals from Yannick Carrasco and Romelu Lukaku weren't enough to send the Red Devils through as they failed to produce yet again. Spain eased past Italy, ending their 37-game unbeaten run and leaving the European champions without a chance to add their second trophy of the year. Cristiano Ronaldo's civil rape case could be thrown out in the coming weeks. The alleged assault took place in 2009 at a Las Vegas hotel, but the judges recommended a dismissal due to the prosecution's reliance on leaked evidence. The Portugal forward also avoided criminal proceedings due to a lack of evidence. Tomorrow night we'll see the conclusion of the bitter Fury Wilder rivalry. The final fight in the trilogy was due to take place in July, but was postponed due to Tyson Fury testing positive for COVID-19. Fury won the last fight convincingly, forcing Wilder's team to throw in the towel midway through the seventh round. Formula One returns this weekend after a week-long break for the 16th race of the season. The teams travel to Turkey after a frenetic contest in Russia as the heated championship battle between Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen rages on. Ferrari driver Carlo Sanz will, be be will begin the day from the back of the grid as a result of an engine-related penalty with a host of teams rumoured to be considering power unit changes this weekend. The weather is expected to be better than the torrential conditions that affected a thrilling day and prevented Lando Norris from achieving a maiden race victory. World Cup winner Ben Stokes has had a second operation on his finger and is now extremely unlikely to play a part in this year's Ashes series against Australia due to begin in December. The mercurial all-rounder has only played in a three-match one-day international series against Pakistan this summer after taking a break from the sport to protect his mental health. The blow creates further issues for England, with fast bowler Jofra Archer and Harry Stone already expected to be absent due to injury. The trio serve as three of the nation's most effective offensive forces and may prove detrimental towards England's prospects of reclaiming the prestigious series. Top women's strawweight contenders Mackenzie Dern and Marina Rodriguez will clash in the main event of this weekend's UFC Fight Night, scheduled to start in the early hours of Sunday morning. The fighters sit fourth and sixth respectively in the current rankings, with Dern riding a four-fight win streak and Rodriguez boasting wins over top contenders Amanda Rebus and Michelle Waterson. Both women have only one loss apiece on their records and are on the brink of a title challenge against dominant division champion Valentina Shevchenko. The Kazakhstani champion successfully defended her belt for the sixth time against Lauren Murphy and looks a daunting test for whoever faces her next. With the number of women engaging in football rising by the year, we sent Jack Bishop to Test Park to see firsthand the growth of the women's football setup at Solent Ladies. The development of women's sport in the UK has accelerated rapidly in recent years, and there is perhaps no finer example than the Solent Ladies football team. Attendance has more than doubled, with as many as 40 girls attending the first open training session of the new term. Ladies first team coach Rafa Citron has been speaking about the increase in interest and ability. It's a massive thing, you know, because people are watching now, they are interested in women's football. And I can see every year, you know, the level of the girls are improving and the numbers as well are getting higher. Between Team GB's ladies achieving Olympic success in Tokyo, promotion of the 100 cricket tournament, and more female pundits covering the Euros, it was a summer of representation for women in sport. But can the recent increase in exposure really be responsible for so many women taking up a sport? First team captain Nellie Woodcock spoke alongside one of the new players, Gracie Hoden, as they discussed why so many girls are getting involved in sport now. I think because it's got a bigger audience now, it's less scary, if that makes sense, coming, coming here knowing there's going to be a few people. Personally, I watched the uh, Team GB women's at the football. Um, it was amazing to see the crowd and the coverage on Twitter as well, which is not what we saw last time the Olympics went on. So I think probably a lot of these girls here probably watched it and were inspired, and a lot of young girls probably as well. On top of any inspiration female athletes may provide, Solent Ladies mainstay Lily Dusting has simply been itching to get back on the pitch during COVID-19 restrictions. Just seeing how well England have been doing, saying like the Euros and stuff in the Olympics. It's just good to see that popularity has like risen and that like everyone's just getting more intrigued and playing and everything and obviously without COVID as well. Last season we played competitively, we reached the national trophy finals. So it's uh, that, that's the, the minimum we, we want to get. I know it's going to be hard, but that's the challenge. We need to do better in the league, so trying to push for the title until the, the last 
uh, round and obviously trying to get in the Bucks uh, big Wednesday once more. The NBA isn't the only basketball returning for preseason as Josh Masoka takes a look at how Solent basketball have returned from a lengthy break due to the coronavirus pandemic. As the nation steadily returns to normality following the turbulence of the last year and a half, Solent basketball are poised to take to the court again. Last season saw their squad subject to training under the various government revised COVID guidelines, but were allowed to exceed the rule of six through the elite sports exemption. The season was eventually suspended before league play following the announcement of the winter lockdown measures. However, the prospects of this season are looking much higher after over 60 players attended trials and fixtures have been lined up for the new year. The British universities and college sports have released a set of COVID guidelines in a bid to keep their student athletes and event staff safe during this period of uncertainty. Bucks are encouraging athletes to, f to be fully vaccinated before play and have said that proof of vaccination can be used in place of a lateral flow or PCR test. They have also encouraged regular hand washing and the completion of a COVID-19 questionnaire, as well as making the wearing of masks mandatory for staff and volunteers. With 75% of the population now boasting fully vaccinated status, the return to normality in sports is looking more and more realistic with every jab. Team Solid Basketball last competed in regular season play in the middle of the 2019-2020 season before the initial outbreak of the pandemic. Division 1 point guard Josh Mazzoke spoke in his excitement approaching the long-awaited return of athletic competition. Now, I feel it really feels great to be able to have a season again, you know, to go back into normal play. I haven't actually played since uh, like May 2019, so just to be able to have a normal season and be back in the action uh, going through trainings right now, it's just been great to have like regular play, have all the numbers there, and um, no, I'm just really excited to get to get going. The squad tip off at Jubilee Sports Centre next Wednesday against Southampton Uni at 8 p.m. I'm Jack Brazil, and this is Solent Sports News. The return of sport across all levels is a breath of fresh air after the restrictions implemented due to coronavirus. But in Wales, the use of COVID passports has been trialled to help things run more smoothly. Mickey Dreisati had a look at how this might affect the rest of the United Kingdom. The Welsh government has announced that vaccine passports will be required in order to attend major sporting events. That means that anyone over the age of 18 will be required to have one of these passports or a negative test in order to attend the games. That will affect supporters of the likes of Swansea and Cardiff City, as well as the travelling ones such as Bournemouth, who have yet to travel to Swansea this season. Controversial topic, but what will the fans think? I think it's a good idea. I think uh, we all want these things to keep going so like we've had so long without being able to do these events I think it's a very small price to pay. I like that it doesn't restrict freedom because I think a lot of people are kind of concerned about having being forced essentially to take a vaccine especially in this country we've got such a weirdly developed culture. I think it's a good idea personally like, I know they do it in France at the moment and I think as much as some people are annoyed about it I think it does help with restricting COVID, like there's going to be less of it, I think, if we prove that we've either been vaccinated or had a test. I think it might stop spreading it. Mixed feelings from the supporters. We also spoke to people inside the game who disagree on the matter. From my point of view, I've, I've, I've got no issue with it. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they enforce it. Uh, but in principle, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think we're going to have a surge at some point. It's my personal opinion. Um, and I'd rather they were able to keep football stadiums open. I suppose as a, uh, from, a, from a club business kind of perspective, you know, it is an increase, certainly an increased administrative burden in that sense. And I, 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 think, I think for me, it would need to be very much a kind of a, a last resort. It's an issue that continues to divide the nation. But the most important thing is that the supporters are back where they belong in the stands. Miki Sati, Solent Sports News. Our live team also went to Test Park today to see the return of the Solent men's football as they gear up for the return of their season and take a deeper look into the mental health benefits in the return of the sport. I'm here at Test Park Sports Ground, the home of Solent football. The men's first team begin their long awaited return to a full season of football next week when they face Bournemouth University in a South Coast derby. We were here on Monday night when the team were training ahead of their season opener. Here's how they got on. 
Silent men's football team braved the weather on Monday night as they trained ahead of their season opener next week. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the team were unable to complete an entire season of football last year, but are now back in full training with a busy schedule approaching. First team manager Alex Walker gave his thoughts on how it feels to be back coaching his players. Thoroughly exciting, um, really great to be back, um, whole sense of normality now. Um, with, with football returning and being able to train in such numbers as well, not having the restrictions. Um, really excited to see where, where we go with this group and, and just to be back training every Monday and Friday. Fantastic. It's not just the coaching team that are happy to be back after a long absence away from the game, with the players feeling just as excited. Captain and president of Solent Men's Football, John Baisley, shared his feelings on what it's like to be back involved with the team. Absolutely buzzing. I mean, we've generally been waiting like a year, a uh, year and a half for this, so I cannot wait. Alongside studying, taking part in sport is a crucial aspect of students' university life. With his players being able to play again, Walker is hopeful it will have a positive effect on his team's well-being. I think it's a massive positive. I think um, it's uh, to be for that to have been missing for so long. Um, I think was a was a big hole in a lot of people's lives, and especially in, in, in footballers and, and other sports as well. So I think it's going to have a massive positive impact, and hopefully we see the the, ref, the reflection of that on the pitch. Alongside the coaches hoping football will have a positive impact, the players are also hopeful of the same outcome, as Baisley shares his thoughts. Well, it's so important for our own mental health. I mean, especially in young men. I mean, the suicide rates are quite high, so but but sport does counteract that. So if we get as many boys out playing football, then it'd be brilliant. And especially for the first years, who obviously missed last year because of COVID, and then this year they've actually had a full season of sport. Liam Davies, Solent Sports News. That's all from us for now. Check the Solent Journalism website for more headlines. I'm Harry Smith, and this is Solent Sport News.